To begin our webinar today, I would like to start with an acknowledgement of country. Given that I am located at USQ, mine will be contextualized for my location. However, I would encourage all of you to consider the lands upon which you work and live, and to please uh, acknowledge those within the chat as you are comfortable. So USQ would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we gather. We would also like to pay our respect to elders, past, present, and emerging. So welcome to today's webinar. I will pass over to Stephen, who will, be, who will start things off, and I will see the rest of you in the chat. Morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. Just thought I'd introduce Angie first. She's the uh, Program Coordinator of Open Education at Deakin University Library. Since 2021, she's been coordinating the Open Educational Resources Grants Program, which she'll be talking about today, supporting project teams and advancing the discussion of open education at the university. She promotes the use of OER and open educational practices and participates in the wider open community through the, uh, this community, the Ascolite OEP Special Interest Group, as well as the call enabling the modern curriculum OER advocacy project team as well. So quite the CV. So Angie, if you're ready, uh, take it away. Hi everyone. Thanks Stephen and Adrian for inviting me along. Um, I'd just like to add that I'm on traditional Wurundjeri lands and I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which I'm located. Um, as Adrian and Stephen said, my name's Angie. I'm the Program Coordinator of Open Education at Deakin University. Now, let me just share my screen. I'll put up what we'll do is well, I'll run through my experiences of establishing the grant program, and then I hope others that are, have been involved in grant programs will join with, in with the discussion. So feel free to ask questions as we go or add them into the chat. Um, I can't see the chat, so maybe Stephen, if there's a good question and it needs to be asked in context, then maybe just ask it. <laughs> Turn on your mic and ask that one. Um, so as I said, I'm currently the Program Coordinator Open Education, and I've been in this role since April last year. Prior to this role, I was a liaison librarian supporting accounting, economics, and finance for a few years. During this time, I'd periodically have a look at what OER were around for these disciplines, and I'd forward some links to academics who I thought might be interested. And this was me dipping my toe into OER, but I found that there wasn't a lot of uptake. And I think this is a pretty common experience for many librarians. Academics either haven't heard of OER or they're a bit skeptical to get into that sort of environment. At this stage, when I was doing this, Deakin didn't have a central OER program or philosophy. There were isolated incidents, instances of open textbook uptake, but nothing that was centrally coordinated or tracked. Then in 2021, the Inclusive Digital Education Project commenced. Now this is an overarching program that highlights and developed inclusivity and accessibility into our process as an online environment. As part of the Inclusive Digital Learning Resources part of the program, this is where our OER grant program fits in. OER fits in beautifully with Inclusive Digital Education, as many of you who have followed Sarah Lambert's research will understand. Along with the ability to design resources with accessibility in mind, OER can be created to be more representational and inclusive, and there are also no paywalls, so this makes them more equitable. The focus of the Inclusive Learning Resources Program is to support staff in developing their capacity to use OER principles and practices in units and courses, remembering that these are new to our institutional environment. One of the ways we're doing this is with the grant program, and the, associate, and the associated support that went with it. And this enabled OER to be investigated, adapted, created, and incorporated into units. In tandem with the grant program, we also held a number of events. Um, I ran some webinars as we're all online at this stage. Uh, we ran an online hackathon. We ran a workshop at our internal teaching and learning conference, which added to our internal awareness raising. So 2021 was the inaugural year of our grant program. Um, and so this is just a little bit about our grant program to start off with. Our program kicked off in June last year with a call for applications. And as this was the first time we'd run a, a program like this, we were unsure as to how the call for applications would go. 
We received a number of applications and we ended up accepting 11 of these. As the aim of the program was to raise awareness and capacity build staff in OER, the program covers the wider spectrum of OER. And so this includes both the use and creation of open resources with the aim of fostering open practice. One difference with the Deakin program is that we're not focused on textbooks. Some grant programs will focus on textbooks to fill a gap, available, a gap in the available text for students. The aim of including other types of OER in the Deakin program is still to support teaching and learning, but where there are gaps in available teaching resources, sometimes these can be better served by a resource other than a textbook. The projects from the 2021 grant program included a variety of open educational practice. We had projects that flipped units to an OER textbook from a commercial text and created ancillary activities to support this text. One of these was a large biology unit with more than a thousand students where the previous text was over $180, so it saved students quite a bit of money. We had a project that is updating an open text, one that remixed open text into PDF resources for students instead of prescribing having a prescribed textbook, and one that incorporated OER resources into a World Religions unit. We also had a team that created a student stories hub with videos by students for students. And two of our larger projects were in the health faculty, um, one of these involved the creation of the Grad Companion, there's a picture of that on my slide here, um, which is a collection of MRI slides of the body torso that were labelled to help with the teaching of anatomy. Um, and the other project involved a move to an open source, open source statistical software um, away from a proprietary software. And this included the move to an open textbook to support the open software from a previous commercial textbook and additional activities were also created to support teaching using the new software. So the projects came from across the faculties and while some were completed within our six month time frame, others are still ongoing. Anyone involved in higher education in the latter half of last year will remember how difficult this time period was. We're located in Victoria and here we had extended lockdowns, stressed and anxious students, workplace reforms, it was a perfect storm of impediments to projects additional to teaching responsibilities. To add to that, this was our first go at this, um, and we probably didn't have the right platforms ready to go. We had planned to take baby steps to start with, but we sort of jumped in with both feet by accepting 11 projects. <laughs> we didn't have a platform for publishing open text, for making some of the ancillary activities available. And the workaround for this was the creation of a website for the 2021 project. But as we have the platforms available and the resources are completed, we'll have make these resources available through both Pressbooks and Figshare. For our program this year in 2022, we have eight projects, um, and these are a fairly even mix of textbook creation and adoption and video creation projects. So now as we were new to OER and open education, um, prior to my role, there wasn't any sort of dedicated open ed role in the library. Um, Deakin doesn't have a publishing arm and the library didn't have staff who were researchers in the area so we were complete newbies to the area. To start off with we consulted widely, we discussed OERs and grant programs with others in Australian academic libraries to hear about their experiences and learnings and then we thought about how and what would suit our structure and our program aims. Um, I also read fairly widely, there's lots of literature from overseas on grant programs in addition to the academic literature, have a look at open ed blogs and guides on open pedagogy. These can include some really useful pointers and tips for setting up grant programs. And also look for OERs on grant programs. OER Commons is a good source for resources on establishing grant programs. And this is also a good way of practicing what we preach and to learn the pros and cons and pain points of OERs. And this is also what's so great about the open education environment too. Many practitioners are happy to share, and some universities have their, their grant program resources available with Creative Commons licences. This is an example of, of an on-site. Um, this is from the University of Oklahoma, and it includes an overview of the grant program, along with a scoring rubric. And if we scroll down to the bottom, they have a Creative Commons licence. So, Used with attribution, these resources can be really useful when you're putting together your own grant program. And also have a think about the organisational culture and the objectives of your program. 
I like this diagram from Trotter and Cox of the OER Adoption Pyramid. The full poster includes questions to establish the readiness of the organisation or individual. At Deakin, we were new to OER, and so we were at the awareness and capacity building stages, and so our program was tailored to this. By not limiting to textbooks, academics were able to see a gap in the resources and then creatively develop the most suitable resource to fill this gap, rather than being limited to a particular format. And this hopefully developed open practice within the academics with less restrictions. Now, just a, a quick word about seeking applications. Um, be mindful of academic loads. Week one of semester one is probably not the best time to have applications submitted. Deacon, we run three trimesters, so it can be hard to find a good time. Um, this year, we squeezed our applications in early in the year, which also gave the grant recipients longer for their projects, which are due to be completed by the end of this year. We ran an information session covering details of the grants and also covering the recipients' responsibilities to ensure that the academics knew what they were getting into. We also adjusted our application form for 2022. We had found that some applicants the previous year underestimated the time the projects would take. And so we introduced some project planning questions into the application to hopefully alleviate this a bit. So now once we had the um, once we accepted the applications, then we entered into the support and training phase. The support is one of the main aspects to the program. I'm sure that others here involved in grant programs will agree. You don't just hand over the grant funds and the creators hand you back the completed product. There's a lot of steps in between. The support provided in our program kicked off with a training session. The first half of this covered the basics of OER and licensing with an example from a practitioner. And this was followed by a, a searching workshop where we looked at the main platforms and some of the other locations to give everyone a background in what is available for their discipline, but also what OERs are and what, what they can look like. Following on from this, in 2021, we had a community of practice. Last year, as this was our first go, um, it was more of a training program rather than a true community of practice. Everyone was new and learning at the same time. We all, and I include myself in this, had to upskill a lot in OER. The community of practice sessions ran once a month and we had guest speakers and experts come along. The copyright team presented at the session on copyright and licensing. We had an experienced practitioner come to our session on open pedagogy. And so I tried to tailor the sessions to the needs of the projects at that particular time. This year, due to our mix of projects, I've adjusted the sessions to include video production for OER, as the number of our projects this year are creating video resources. And we're very lucky because one of our projects last year did exactly this. And so our one of our project teams from last year came along and discussed the process and the considerations such as consent forms before this year's projects got too far along. We also had a team site repository, um, which was great for storing all of the, the useful docs and resources. Uh, I also added links to interesting webinars and resources, as well as the resources from the session. So. We, this was our storage place for stuff like templates for, for recording your searching or for planning your project. Access to this meant that the project teams had access to the resources at their time of need. I also met with library liaison teams to let them know about projects in their faculties that may have a, a searching component as the liaison librarians might have been called on to help with searching or with other expertise. And the team site also helped to keep communication channels open um, and facilitated conversations between the projects and the copyright team, as the copyright team were included on the site as well. One point I will add in here is, as we were so new to, um, to OERs and open education, the whole concept of open resources may need some time for academics to adjust to. From the time we started uni, we are made aware of you know, not using other people's stuff. And so the idea of openly using and adapting someone else's resources can be a complete change of thinking for academics. I ran a workshop last year introducing OER and OEP to academics. And one academic described learning about these as learning a threshold concept that changes your viewpoint on the world. And this sort of thought disruption can take some time for academics to work through. So the support is one of the major parts of the program. And the participants in the program also had the opportunity to present in other internal events that contributed to our organisational awareness raising. We had panel sessions and presentations that contributed to raising the awareness of OER in the wider community outside of the, the project teams. 
So as with any program, as you as you go through, you evaluate and then you change. So when we look at evaluating our program, we refer back to our aims, which in this case was awareness raising and capacity building. And this was to establish if our aims of our program had been achieved. As part of the program, we produced a number of internal blog posts and articles to raise awareness. Up until the end of last year, these articles have had over 700 views of both the library and the DTEACH blog articles. The website of the project, which is available both internally and externally, this year has had 1150 views. Um, so this sort of indicates that our awareness reaching, our awareness raising has had a fairly wide reach. With regards to our capacity building, with the sessions that we ran, we had just under 170 staff attend an event. And this was over the six months. And this included the program that was offered to the project teams, as well as our seminar series on the, the power of open that included a discussion session and a hackathon. In evaluating the program, there were a number of things that worked and some that didn't. As we started off mid-year, our initial program only lasted six months, and this was one thing that made it difficult. The other major hurdle was 2021 in general. With online teaching and lockdowns, it was a very stressful year all round. To offset this feedback that we got from one of our grant participants was that they felt that with all of the issues that we had going on last year, it was great to have a positive project to focus on. So this was one of the, the positives that came out of our program last year. While some projects were completed within our time frame, others are still ongoing. As I mentioned earlier, we also adjusted our application form for 2022 to include some project planning to ensure that applicants were aware of the time commitment that was involved in creating some of these resources. We also actually completely changed our structure of our grant program between 2021 and 22. Last year, all of our applicants received the same level of grant, but this year we've introduced a tiered grant system. This was changed as last year's projects were so varied in scope and size that it seemed that some such as the larger, more complex projects would have benefited from a higher level of grant. And this again will be, will be evaluated at the end of this year's program, the program to determine its effectiveness. Our multi-prom support worked well, and this is happening again this year. Uh, the training, the team site, the opportunities to present on the progress, all work to support the projects. And personalised support is also available by email and catch-ups when any of the teams need to. Now, the plan from here on is to establish a wider community of practice so that the grant recipients from last year, other open educational practitioners within the institution, can, they can be supported to further their practice. Um, and the new wave of practitioners can also learn from those with experience. So I'm aiming to set this up in the next few months. It's also useful to gather feedback from those in the program to discover any pain points or things that you haven't considered and to think about what can be improved. So if we have a look at the, the program in light of the organisational goals, do they still align for the future? Has there been a new strategic plan developed requiring a tweak of the program? I know that at our institution, we've recently had a new library strategic plan issue. And so with our grant program for next year, we'll tweak this to make sure that it's in line with our, our library strategic goals. And also be aware of the external environment. Are there new tools you can utilise, new platforms, new resources to support your program and the projects that you support? One example of this is the Call Collective Pressbooks program pilot. Um, this will, we'll be using this in support of our, our program project teams this year. Now, the last one on the list here is the big one. Um, there have been so many developments over the last couple of years, particularly in the Australian environment. Keep talking to others in open education. I personally found this Escalate OEPC group a great source of info and a great way to connect with others with an interest in open. I've also found it useful to regularly reflect on the program. Um, I think this is an easy, easy step to miss, but it is just so useful. As you're setting up the program or at different stages when you, when you implement something, take the time to reflect on that program at that point and take notes on it. Um, these notes can be really useful when you're designing the next iteration, as it can be really easy to forget the process that you went through and how, how that process went when you've moved on to the later stages. Another recent resource that I want to highlight here is the, 
OER starter kit for program managers. Um, hopefully someone will just stick that one in the chat for me. I wish this had been around when we started, when I started on this journey. Um, it's a fantastic resource with lots of in-depth practical discussion of introducing a, an OER program. So now in the future, um, I have recently organised an internal Open Education Day of Dialogue at our university, where stakeholders from across the university came together to discuss what the future should look like and how we're going to get there. Our OER program is currently funded on a yearly basis, um, and so this will be evaluated again at the end of this year and adjusted to support our goals as we move forward. And lastly, I just wanted to add, make sure you celebrate your achievements. Um, at the end of last year, we had a session where the participants ran through um, where they'd got to with their projects and the achievement that they'd made in the trying environment was just amazing. It was such a positive session. When we, uh, while we often think about sharing our successes outside the organisation, we use Twitter or blogs to celebrate these achievements. Make sure to do this internally also. We've had grant teams participate in webinars, do podcasts, panel sessions, find ways to get word around the institution and keep awareness raising as this can then feed back into your grant program for next year. So that's about it for my experience. Uh, that seemed to go a lot quicker than I had practised earlier. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to stop sharing and let's have a look at the chat and see if we've got any questions in there. Angie, we've got a question from Thomas Palmer from UQ. Um, he would like to hear what you think is the best approach to advertising and enrolling new users in the grant scheme. Um, do you proactively reach out to likely candidates or do you rely on librarians, learning designers to provide leads or, or do you have academic self-select? This is a um, multi-pronged sort of question here. Um, we have a number of ways that we do this. Um, at the moment, because our program is still quite new, um, I've been I've got an agenda of going out and talking to each of the teaching and learning committees for each of the different schools. Um, recently, I went and spoke to the School of Medicine. Um, I've got the School of Law coming up, um, and I've been through education and business as well. And I find this is one approach that is really useful because if you want to make open education and open educational resources well used within the university, it, it takes a, a, a number of um, actions to do this. And so the best way is to work from the top down. So if you can talk to those that are higher up in the university to make it part of the, the culture and the, the organisational planning, um, that's the best way to get in. But you also need to have the, the buy-in from the individual academics as well. So you also need to focus those at that level so that then they can talk up as well. Um, I work closely with the liaison librarians here at Deakin. Our structure is we have um, subject liaisons that go out and talk to the, the different schools. Um, and so I work fairly closely with them where we see an opportunity. Um, there might be, um, say, for example, if there's a textbook and the license through the library is very restrictive. Um, we might have a look at that and see if there's any alternatives and then we might sort of set a, have a target program in place. Um, each, each time you go and talk to someone, um, focus on what their issue is. Um, if they have an issue with uh, you know, students not buying the text or if they have an issue with student retention, those sorts of things are the good things to focus on. Um, and if you can find those out before you actually go and talk to people, then that can have great benefits for your program. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to add on that? That's really useful, Angie. Um, there's another question too from Annette Goodwin. And the question is, just wondering if you engaged your learning and teaching uh, educational designers for this project? We certainly do. Um, we're working in partnership with our educational designers. Um, at Deakin, we've got a structure where 
each of the faculties has learning designers and um, learning designers and experts in creating objects included with each of the faculties. And so we work closely with them so that it's sort of a, um, a double prongs the court. So you've got your academic um, who is the subject expert and we can support them both with like learning design, creation of resources, um, copyright advice. There's lots of different ways that people in the library can assist with um, academics creating resources. And especially with the, the learning design, because we weren't limited to textbooks, um, a lot of things can be done in, in different formats that are much more useful for students. Um, I know when I went to study, <laughs> having to read you know, chapters three and five of the textbook and then answer questions was a pretty boring way to learn. Um, but now if students can have infographics, H5P activities, um, and we did have a wide range of things like that that were included in our, our grant program. Um, often academics would start with an idea and then it would just snowball. Um, they'd think of things that they could do. They could create question banks. They could do H5P activities and videos. And that was one of the issues that can be a, a problem is the need to focus on a particular resource if you're looking at doing grants. Um, for the what we can support with the grant is sort of only this much of the bigger picture. Um, and so it's just sort of, it sets that seed of the, the open resources that people can use. Thanks, Angie. We've got another question from, uh, this one's from Alison Lockley from Charles Darwin University. And she asks, how do you share the OER within the institution? Is there some kind of space where you showcase them? At the moment, no. Um, this is one of the issues that we did find because we, we jumped in um, fairly quickly. <laughs> uh, we didn't quite have the, the technology set up to enable a lot of the things that people wanted to do. Um, we've currently joined, we're, at the moment, we're with the call collective for press books. Um, and so this year, we've got a number of textbook writing projects which are going to make use of that platform. Depending on how we go with that, we may end up getting our own press books instance. Um, and we also have to work out what sort of support we're going to provide around that. So that's part of our project for this year. The other side of it was other resources. Um, we're looking at, we did have a, an institutional repository, um, but it's become, it needs to be replaced. And so they're sort of going through the process of doing that at the moment. Um, and so we're heading down the fixed share road, which I think the Trobe's got. Um, and so we're heading down that road, the ancillary activities available. So at the moment, we've got the website. Um, we did have one project that had a whole heap of YouTube videos. Um, but that's just sort of been removed at the moment because we're just getting some additional consent. Um, but then we've, um, once we've got the activities up and running and also with our program, because we, last year we only went for the six months, some of the creation programs are still being created. Uh, most of the ones that are completed are the ones that we're, we're using and adapting resources. So um, these take a, a lot less time than it does to create a, a full resource. So as these are coming online, then we'll move them on to fix you once we've got it. Yeah, that's great, Angie. Um, we've also got a question from Marianne Sato from University of Queensland. And her question is, did your grant program address any aspects of maintenance and updating of content after the OER is produced? Uh, and wh what happens down the track after the grants are used? That's an excellent question because um, one thing I find, especially with project work, um, is once the project finishes, then that's the end of the funding and there's, there isn't really much in the way of maintenance. Um, we're lucky with our strategic plan that OERs are sort of taking a, 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 a major role in there or part of a role in there. <laughs> um, and so hopefully from that, we'll be able to maintain things as like going forward. We have only just started down this track. So um, maybe if there's some people here who have more experience in longer term programs, they may have some 
input on that one. Um, but we don't really have, we haven't really got that far as yet because we're still at the, at the initial creation stages. Another question from Annette um, from Charles Sturt University. Are the resources shared on a platform like OER Commons? And does your institutional IP policy, perhaps that means IP policy, uh, specifically inc include or indicate Creative Commons licenses? Okay. Um, we do, or we will be sharing them on OER Commons. Um, we do have a, a Deakin University space on there. Um, which will sort of collate all of our, our resources together. Um, but a general search will be able to find them as well. Um, I didn't want to put them directly on OER Commons before we got Figshare because then we have a bit of version control of an issue. So I want one version to be out at a time. And I think our source of truth is going to be our Figshare site. So um, our OER Commons is going to link to our link back to our, our Figshare. Um, rather than having two places where we need to update things. So, um, our institutional IP is, I think, similar to a lot of other universities here in Australia where um, what you create in, in the um, course of your work, the IP is owned by the institution. Um, we do have a process for approving these. Um, part of the grant program is that they need approval from the head of school, um, which sort of indicates a, a tacit approval from the organisation that is going to be made in OER. Um, but once it does get to the created phase, it goes through our copyright team who go through it with a fine tooth comb and check that everything's attributed, everything's um, able to be made open with a Creative Commons licence. Um, and then the actual academic gets to pick what sort of academic, what Creative Commons licence they think is most appropriate to the resource that they've created. Hopefully it's a, a CC BY or a CC by NC. Um, we do have a bit of an issue with the share alikes, um, but if, if we could make it CC by, that would be great. But we don't dictate what, what it should be. Angie, I've got a question of my own, which is about your the, the decision to focus on, I suppose, non textbook OER. Um, can you can you say a bit more about that and what informed that decision? And also, sorry, there's a double-barreled question. And uh, maybe what are the yeah what are the pros and cons of focusing on multimedia or H5P kind of OER as opposed to say digital te textbooks or open textbooks? Okay, um, I suppose it's sort of a similar argument to lectures or non-lectures, isn't it? Do we stick with what we know or do we move on to new pedagogical models? Um, the reason we, we did include both was because there can be such a, a range of resources that can either be OER or be made OER. Um, and especially with the, the revise and remit, the, the idea is to include, is to increase open educational practice um, and so by introducing academics to the ability to reuse and remix and to recreate things in different formats, um, sort of further that idea of open educational practice. There are pros and cons, of course. Um, we all know video is really expensive to create, um, but then if you're going to be creating a textbook and you're outsourcing your, your editing and your, um, your formatting, all that sort of stuff, that can cost as well. Um, and we do have quite a bit of in-house resources where we can create, where we can focus on creating things like video. Um, we've got institutional H5P, so they can be directly embedded into units. So, it, and I suppose also when you've got video, that can be made available through a, a YouTube channel and they can be applied with a Creative Commons license as well. So that's sort of a, a simple platform of making things out there and available. Um, the other, one of the other pros is that you can tailor it to your pedagogical needs. Um, say, for example, if you've got a, a textbook with a long chapter, you may only need four or five paragraphs out of that, which might be better off as, a, as an infographic. 
Um, it might be better off as a H5P flip card activity. And so that was their main reason we didn't focus on textbooks. Um, although, I mean, when you look at a, a pressbooks textbook, sometimes it is hard to, to equate that with the, with the textbook. Um, a lot of them will have built-in videos and H5Ps. And I suppose it just matters, it just um, goes back to whether you want your resources all in one place in your LMS or whether you want to have people having to go to two different places to find their resources. Um, so I think that was one of the main reasons that we focused on both, but the main reason was to um, develop the internal practice. So now that we've been talking for a while, um, in our poll at the start, we had a few people who had already been involved in grant programs. Um, so if we're talking iterating grant programs, has anyone um, got any tips on moving forward and have your goals changed over time with the, with the grant programs that you've been running? Um, I know with ours, because we're just starting off, our goals are similar to what they were last year, which was mainly we're still at the awareness and ca ca capacity building phase. Um, I have a question for everyone. Have your goals changed over time? What are you trying to achieve with, with your grant programs? Well, I suppose for our grants, we positioned ours as both educational change, so supporting educational change, and ours were um, directly linked to our social justice uh, strategic action plan. So we wanted ours from the very beginning to be about a change of practice and a sustained change of practice, and that we wanted to provide an explicit link between our educational practices and the social justice initiatives of the university. Uh, mostly what ours have done, because we, we haven't really changed very much in terms of what the expected outcomes are, which is that um, it's a competitive process. People need to identify which part of the, the social justice strategic action plan they are going to align with um, in order to demonstrate that the work that they are doing is helping us to achieve our goals within that plan. Um, I think that overall the actual categories have changed we started with open textbooks back in 2015 uh, because we thought that this would be a concept that most people would be familiar with and that it represented a very small step in a change of reality rather than a very radical step um, and since then we've also had um, open assessment as a category and we've got some people who are now exploring that and we've also um, as of last year we included open ancillary resources as a category um, this idea being that a lot of open textbooks you get the textbook by itself and there's a broader movement within the open community to make the textbooks more viable and attractive against commercial counterparts by including things like lecture slides, quiz banks, case studies, all the sort of stuff that if you adopt a, a commercial textbook, the publisher would give you. Um, and OpenStax is doing some great work in that area. Uh, we, don't, we didn't actually have anyone in the last two years, the two offerings, apply for the ancillary resources category. They've all stuck with open assessment and open texts. Uh, one of the things, because we're focused on educational change and it is about forming a community of learners over the 18 months, uh, we do find that people then sustain um, their materials because they build it into their practice. And we've got about 90% of our outputs from the grants are still used um, two years past the funding um, period has actually ceased. Um, we do also find that those people have updated or they have engaged with learning designers or their liaison librarians um, and they've been able to update and keep those current. That's great so, to hear does, that they, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting though that they haven't done um, ancillary activities, but I can see why, especially um, like with talking to academics, you do find they say, you say, oh, there's this great open textbook and they'll say, okay, but what instructor resources are with it? Um, and that's where our ancillary grants can come in, is they can 
use that grant to then create the the associated videos to go with it or the um or the slides and we know how tight time is with with academics um i know that at, at our institution sometimes they'll buy out some marking time with their grant so that they can give themselves some time to then go and create these ancillary resources uh, interesting to hear about the maintenance as well um with our program being so new we're hoping that it will grow um, some of the, the program projects that we have had, they've given an indication that they'd like to continue on for the for the next year or so, if we can give them some more funding, um, to develop the resources into a, a, a larger a larger project. Um, it would have been it would be nice to be able to support everybody, um, but I think we all know that in higher education at the moment funds are fairly restricted, <laughs> um, and so we have it would be well it would be good to fund more projects. But there is a, a bit of a limit that we have to have to stick to. Um, has, I'll add, sorry, uh, I was going to add one one other thing that that we do, which I think is slightly different to to a lot of grants, is that um, there's normally some form at the end of most grants of a final report or some sort of an acquittal or a memo of some description. Um, three years ago, we moved away from that. And the grant requirements are now that at the end of the funded period, you produce a draft journal article ready for submission. And so they build in some scholarship of learning and teaching as part, and they are explicitly supported to do so, uh, with the idea then being that they will publish in a you know, reputable open access journal at the end of the grant period. And that's actually made these more attractive because staff are then saying, well, I get teaching and learning outcomes, which I can include in my annual performance review or promotions document or the like. And in addition to this, you're asking me to do research and get a publication, hopefully a Q1. Um, so that ticks my research box as well. Um, so they, they're actually now starting to become a lot more attractive. Mm. And you do touch on an interesting point there, which is how to get academics to commit to creating an, an open resource such as a textbook, which takes a lot of time, which then I know at our institution isn't part of the reward and recognition. A lot of it is focused on our Q1 journals. So um, it does make it a bit hard for academics to commit to all the time that it creates to create these resources um, without that, that recognition. Um, and also it doesn't contribute to the like the era either. So um, that is a, another consideration that academics think of when they do start getting into these sorts of programs. Yes, and Alison's commented that it's a really good idea about encouraging the scholarship of teaching and learning and integrating that into, into the program. I had a question about um, how you use grants as a way to build community um, and shared OER practices between, between academics from different faculties who otherwise may not know each other. Uh, you did mention a few training sessions and communities of practice. Did you find that there was much sharing between academics um, and, and any kind of collaboration between the grant groups? That came out of this last year not so much um because the projects were very um varied uh we didn't have say a couple of projects that were doing similar things um they were very specific to their their discipline so say for example if um if our project was in ecology then it was very difficult for them to sort of share with the other others in the group about what they what they're searching was finding because it wouldn't have been of any relevance to the others. One thing that did come out of that one was um, the difficulty of remixing. Um, so if we had a, a project that collated all these different resources from different textbooks, um, popped them into a PDF, and there was a lot of discussion about the difficulties of organising 
resources from different resources into one resource. Um, and so it did lead to quite a few copyright conversations, um, project management conversations about how to track the different types of the different resources and where they were coming in and the licenses for those. And so it did sort of, um, the discussion around the practice of, of doing this, it was spread through the group. And even though the other projects weren't quite doing this exact thing, um, they did take, they did sort of enter into a conversation about how difficult it could be to assemble all of these resources into one particular, one single resource. Um, and it did also, we, we did learn a lot last year. Um, this was one of our learnings for, for our copyright team was how to track all of these things that are coming into one particular resource. Um, and so that was one of the main learnings, was more about the, the procedure and the how of doing this rather than what they were doing. Um, and when we did share, like at, at each of our, our community practice sessions, we did have a time at the start where everyone shared what they'd been up to and others did come in with ideas about how they could improve the, the practice of what they were doing um, and also gave others ideas that they could use in their own practice as well. So I think that was one of the main community buildings was the sharing of ideas rather than the actual sharing of um, the processes of what people were going through. Thanks, Angie. We've probably got time for one more question or one more um, if you've got a grants program at your, your institution, if you've got anything to share. So anyone want to take up this last chance? <laughs> I have a last one, if I can, and that is um, how do you conduct evaluation um, for the program itself um, and how successful you've been? And then do you provide any support for the academic staff who are participating to evaluate the outcomes of their own projects? Okay, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, with, with our project, the main aim was our raising awareness and the capacity building. So that's been where we've been evaluating the program up to date. Um, we do keep an eye on um, you know, website views and those sorts of things. Um, and as the projects are becoming more available and they're sort of pushed out into the wild, um, then we'll track usage and, and things like that. We do get where projects have been implemented that are more the usage of OERs within units, um, we get mostly student feedback for those. So a lot of the, the feedback there is more qualitative from students about how they, they enjoy the resources that were created, um, how they're happy that they don't have to buy a textbook. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's where our evaluation for the individual projects has been going on so far. Um, but as time moves on and the resources move on to a platform that we can can track and evaluate, then we'll, we'll definitely keep providing the academics with updates on, on how their resources traveling. Thank you. Well, we will have to wrap up there, but thank you very much, Angie. And um, that was a great summary of what you've been doing at Deakin. And I think, you know, in a lot of ways, this is the year of OER grants. So really good timing to, be sharing these lessons. So, yeah, thanks, Angie. If everyone could give a, I don't know, a digital applause or um, comments in the chat, um, thanking her for for this. Great, thanks uh, for having me. Yeah. Um, so, we will be announcing our next speaker for the upcoming webinar next month soon. Uh, so you can stay in touch and get email updates at the website for this uh, OEP special interest group. I'm putting the URL in the chat. Um, you can get, yeah, emails about future webinars. And now I'm going to hand back to Adrian for farewell. 
Well, thank you very much, Stephen. And I think it, um, first of all, thank you very much, Angie, for sharing your experience today. Uh, we always try to make sure that these webinars are very practical and that they have something that people can take back to their institutions and be able to implement in a, in a very um, straightforward way. And I think that the way in which you communicated your uh, program and also the very common sense things that, that you had um, throughout the presentation are things that we can all implement straight away. So I think in terms of, of um, an applied and practical presentation, uh, this was absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much for coming along today. And also, um, uh, you uh, may not know, uh, as in the, the community may not know, but um, the webinars are actually uh, Stephen's bag for the uh, special interest group. Uh, Stephen is our webinar convener. So if you do have any ideas for future presentations, or better yet, if you would like to um, suggest a colleague or yourself uh, to present a webinar, Stephen is the person to see. And I'd like to extend my gratitude on on behalf of the SIG for the work that Stephen has put into the webinar program uh, this year and the success that we've had. Uh, lastly, thank you everybody for attending today. It's really good to have a core group of practitioners who come together like this. And as Stephen mentioned, we will be having our regular special interest group meeting uh, coming up uh, next month, as well as the webinar for July. So I look forward to seeing all of you and sharing knowledge with you in the coming months. Thanks very much for attending.